All right, let me open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. God, you are so gracious to have spoken to us, to have preserved your word for the building up, the sanctification and edification of your church. And here we are again, a new week, another Sunday, uh, with our Bibles open, looking to hear from you. And so, God, we pray that you would uh, speak clearly this morning, again, through your word, that you would give us understanding and insight and clarity ourselves that we might know what you think, we might conform our thoughts to yours, and as we do that, God, bring our entire lives into submission under your authority, which is so good and right and just and life-giving for us. God, where there may be a sin in us, reveal it, where... Uh, there are things that you are doing in our hearts uh, to encourage us. I pray that we would be encouraged and help us to see clearly what we must this morning. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, welcome back uh, to this Blood for Clarity series. We've been going through the perspicuity of God's word and exploring how persecution and perspicuity tie together, what those two things have to do with one another. And so this is the second part of us answering the question, how clear is God's word really? It's really a, a fun question to explore. Uh, it has been for me to just think of all the ways that God's word is proven to be perspicuous. Last week, we started with seven answers to that question. And we said that God's word is as clear as God's own mind. It is as clear as God's glory demands. God's word is as clear as scripture's synonyms imply. God's word is so clear that it produces clarity. God's word is clear enough to be understood by children. It's clear enough to be understood by unbelievers. And it's clear enough to make martyrs in the Old Testament. This morning, we'll pick back up with an eighth answer to that question, how clear is God's word really? And so you'll have to Keep your ears open, since there's no, uh, there's no PowerPoint this morning. But answer eight, how clear is God's word really? God's word is, as, is clear enough to commission. Clear enough to commission. Go to Acts 13. We'll see the, the first several answers that we have this morning for this question. How clear is God's word really? The first several answers to that question will unfold in Acts chapter 13. It's a lengthy passage, but just like we saw in 1 Kings 22, it actually is really helpful to highlight how clear God is when he speaks. That is verbally or once his words are written down, God always speaks clearly. And the first thing that we see in this passage is God's word is clear enough to commission. Acts chapter 13 puts us in Antioch with the apostle Paul and Barnabas. So starting at verse 1, now there were at Antioch in the church that was there prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius, 
of Cyrene and Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. God's word from these verses is clear enough to commission his sent ones, to commission those he sends on some mission to accomplish his will. In verse 2, the Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit speaks and says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. You'll notice that the specific person of the Trinity speaking here is none other than the Holy Spirit. He speaks and he's articulate and he is clear, so clear that in verse 3, the response to this word given by the Holy Spirit is that they pray fast, lay their hands on the two men identified by the Holy Spirit, Barnabas and Saul, and they did what the Holy Spirit told them to do. They sent them away. They set them apart for this work that they were being called to. Oftentimes when you hear about the Holy Spirit speaking, you're uh, left thinking that he's doing that in the person's life who is saying that they are being led by the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit told them. You're left with the impression that he hasn't used actual words, but some other means, impressions, feelings, uh, random signs that are left up to the person seeing those signs, how to interpret them. This is a good reminder that when the Holy Spirit speaks, he speaks like God speaks. He uses words. He uses grammar and syntax, complete sentences, thoughts. <laughs> this is how the Holy Spirit speaks. Whenever God is said to have spoken, he is speaking in these ways, uh, using clear, articulate words that can be interpreted by man. The Holy Spirit speaks, and he is clear enough to commission. Uh, notice that God's word in this passage, verse 2, was clear enough about the person for the commissioning. It was clear in reference to who should actually go on this mission. And he gives them names, Barnabas and Saul. Verse 4 says, So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Notice that verse 4 says, who sent them out? Who sent out Barnabas and Saul according to verse 4? The Holy Spirit. Verse 3 says, they sent them away. The they being a reference not to the Holy Spirit, but to the prophets, teachers, those who were ministering in When the Holy Spirit identifies men to be sent and the church sends them, that is the Holy Spirit sending them. We don't have the luxury of hearing for each mission uh, the particular servants that God intends to use. Audible voice, send out Zach and Cassidy can, send out Matt and Cameron Dodd, Right? That's not how it happened. 
But God clearly gives us in other passages of Scripture, like Titus 1, like 1 Timothy 3, the standards or the qualifications of those who are uh, equipped and qualified to lead his church. So by inference, the Holy Spirit sends or has told us who to send for missions, missionary endeavors. Um, It would be holy people, people who meet the qualifications of the particular ministry. Um, And obviously, the character being the primary issue in their sending. Not only is God's word clear about the person for the commission, but God's word is clear about the purpose of the commission as well. In what we read in verses 1 through 4, the Spirit doesn't say or give particular details to what these sent ones are supposed to do on this mission. He doesn't work through all of the specifics about what they're supposed to do when they go or get to where they're going. But look what happens in verse 5. When Barnabas and Saul reached Salamis, they did something. They began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. Barnabas and Saul, Paul, along with John Mark, when they got to Salamis, didn't need any more specifics about what they were supposed to be doing in Salamis. What did they do? They started proclaiming the word of God. They didn't need, and you know, beyond what they might have heard directly from the Holy Spirit, we don't know. That's not cataloged for us in Scripture. But assuming that this was all they heard, they already had clear enough instructions about what they ought to have been doing. God was already clear about what the church was supposed to be doing. We're in Acts chapter 13. The church has already been doing what Jesus commissioned his disciples to do when he left them. And so they've already been on this endeavor, obeying the words of Jesus, proclaiming God's word, evangelizing the lost, baptizing those who believe, teaching the saints in the church according to Acts 2, 48 so that they had doctrine of the apostles to adhere to, and they've been establishing the church. What they didn't do when they got to Salamis was poll the community. What they didn't do was host meetings to find out from the community the felt needs of the unbelievers in that that place. They knew what they were supposed to be doing. God's word, what God had already articulated to the church, for the church, through the apostles, had already been clear already. And so they began to do just that. They began to proclaim the word of God. God's word that we have in scripture is clear for these kinds of endeavors. God's word is clear for missions. What do we need to know? To go be effective in a completely different culture, in a completely different context, with people we've never met before. In some instances, we don't even speak the same language as them. What do we need so that we have a clear understanding of what we're supposed to do when we get there. We need what God has clearly revealed in his word. That's it. That will give us the clarity that we need in ministry and missionary endeavors to go love people far away and to effectively bring them the word of God. God's word is clear enough to commission. God's word is also 
clear enough to do several other things. And I'm just going to read these next several answers to the question because these are going to unfold in short order as we keep working through Acts chapter 13. So here, here you go. How clear is God's word really? God's word is clear enough to, commu- to communicate. God's word is clear enough to contradict. God's word is clear enough to convince. God's word is clear enough to confound. God's word is clear enough to comfort. And God's word is clear enough to convert. We will see all of those things in the next several verses as we watch what the Holy Spirit is doing through the ministry of these men who were sent. So turning our attention to verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius, Paulus, a man of intelligence. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, fixed his gaze on him and said, You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not cease or and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Notice, according to verse 5, that God's word was clear enough to communicate. It was clear enough to be communicated, in other words, by two men. God's word was not so lofty and great that it couldn't be comprehended and then communicated to others. When they got to Salamis in verse 5, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And so God's word was clear enough to be communicated. It was clear enough, is clear enough to communicate. That's helpful. Those who teach the Bible, whether you're a parent, whether you're a preacher or a pastor or a teacher in the church, Really, our task is not to make the scriptures clear. Our task is not, in any sense, to bring a degree of clarity to the scriptures that they don't already possess. The preacher's job, the teacher's task, is merely to show the church what's clearly revealed in the Bible. It's already clear. You just need to not mess it up. Just don't make what is clear cloudy. Just don't obscure what is already perspicuous. That's our job. Elders, this is your job when you teach and preach the word. Men, when you teach your small groups, this is your aim. You older ladies who teach in various ministries, this is your one job to make clear for your hearers what the scriptures clearly reveal already. NGM teachers, this is your one job to make sure that you're communicating to children what God clearly communicated first. That's it. Who's the audience? How can I take God's word and help them to see the clarity that's there? That's our job. God's word is even uh, clear enough to check those who are communicating God's word. 
This happens just a few chapters later in Acts 17. You think about Paul's ministry, multiple missionary journeys. He gets to, he leaves Thessalonica for Berea in Acts 17, verse 11. Luke writes, now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So as a teacher, Paul and Paul, nor Paul and Barnabas on their journeys, they were not the ultimate authority. But when they brought the word, even those in uh, Berea, these Bereans are called more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Because of this, they received the word with great eagerness. Their hearts were opened. They gained clarity and insight as the word was taught, and they were eager to hear these things. They rejoiced at the teaching and preaching of God's word. Like so many of you at Grace Bible Church, you hear the word week after week. You're eager for it. You love it. You want more of it. And they also examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. That implies that apart from the teacher proclaiming the word of God, they can actually be checked up on. The word didn't, the clarity of the word didn't change when Paul got done teaching. The clarity of the word was still there, ready and waiting to be examined by the hearers. You can understand the word independent of teachers. And if we're worth our salt as teachers, then we will only enhance your ability to examine the scriptures on your own and see if these things are so. God's word is clear when it's being taught. God's word is clear when it's being read or examined privately. God's word is clear enough to communicate to others. God's word is also, we see in verses 8 through 10, clear enough to contradict that is clear enough to be contradicted by others. Notice, as Paul, according to verse 5, with Barnabas and John Mark, are proclaiming the word of God, this proconsul is seeking to hear the very thing that they're proclaiming at the end of verse 7. He sought to hear the word of God. They're saying something from God. I want to hear what God has to say through those men. But Elymas, the magician, was opposing them. That is, these men who are proclaiming the word of God. His opposition to the men was him seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. What was being proclaimed could have been believed, would have been believed by the proconsul, that is, the faith. These words of God were words to be believed. That's why they're called the faith. And this man is opposing, specifically according to verse 8, the messengers. And then Paul, being filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 9, fixing his gaze on him, says in verse 10, calls him this you know, string of descriptions, full of all deceit, full of all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, those who oppose, those who are accurately handing the word of God, handling the word of God, this is a fitting description for them. Paul, notice what Paul says that he's doing in him preventing or opposing them and preventing Sergius from, from hearing or from... Uh, seeking to turn, away, turn him away from the faith. Paul says, 
Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? What Paul has been proclaiming, which the proconsul was seeking to hear and believe, is the very thing that Paul says is being made crooked by this magician. The implication there is that clarity was going forth, clarity was being had by the hearers because God's word was clearly being proclaimed. And it was so clear that it had to be contradicted. It was so clear that it had to, an obstruction had to be put in the place of it so that it didn't appear so clear. It had to be made crooked. It wasn't already crooked. The obscurity and error and contradictions had to be introduced. Now, just imagine that what Paul and Barnabas and John Mark had been teaching was already unclear. God's word, imagine if it didn't already have clarity, it couldn't be accurately understood, so it couldn't be accurately communicated. If that, if that was true, what need would there have been for this son of the devil to step in and make it obscure? There would have been no need. It's actually the clarity of God's word that makes it worthy of contradiction from unbelievers. It's the clarity of God's word that makes it worthy of Satan's attacks. If God's word wasn't already clear then Satan would would have no job. (laughs) He would be put out of work because the word of God would be going forth and not able to be understood by the hearers, and so his work would be done. It is because God's word is clear that it requires satanic interruption. Matthew 13, with the parable of the soils, articulates the same principle. When the word of the kingdom the message of the kingdom, gospel of the kingdom goes forth. It has to be removed from the heart of the hearers, lest it be understood and believed by them. And so God's word is so clear that it must be contradicted. It is clear enough to contradict, which means that Elymas actually understood what was being said as well, and he knew where he had to put the obstructions. But thankfully, despite those obstructions, God is kind enough to intervene and answer 11 to the question, God's word is clear enough to convince. God's word is still clear enough to convince. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. Paul has just brought down a divine curse on this false prophet. This false prophet is blinded. The very same thing, ironically, he was attempting to do with his words to blind the proconsul to the clarity of God's word ends up happening to him physically at a physical manifestation of his own deception and opposition to God. When he sees that happen, he believes And he's amazed, not at the miracle. That's interesting. Being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. The teaching was what invoked awe. He was awestruck at the teaching that was coming from the mouths of these faithful servants. If God's word was unclear, then it would be impossible to convince someone of it who is bent on believing the truth. Think about the proconsul seeking to hear this message from the Lord. He's desiring truth, which is already evidence of of God at work. And his desire for the truth is not disappointed. Disappointed. 
but he has the clarity of the word taught to him. And he finds it amazing. Answer 12, how clear is God's word really? It's clear enough to confound. It is clear enough to confound, to leave us in awe at what it actually clearly says. Some have said God is too transcendent. He's so far above and beyond us. It would be foolish and blasphemous for us to think that what that he could actually communicate in a way that helps us to understand what he has clearly said. He's just too beyond us. It's actually the exact opposite. God is so great that he can communicate clearly in a way that is intelligible even to nothing. Nothing's like us. You have page after page in your Bible intended to clearly help you see how much you don't know, to really leave you with a sense of awe and amazement. Every, I would argue, every passage of Scripture, every page of your Bible is intended to do that in one way or another. We should be left breathless, gazing into what God has said. And then some passages just leap off the page. Psalm 145, 3. Great is Yahweh and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Wow. God is worthy of great praise, and the kind of greatness that demands a great response in worship, that greatness cannot be fathomed and his greatness is unsearchable. For all of eternity, you think about Abel, who's been, you know, first martyr, first saint to step into heaven, has been for the last 6,000 or so years searching the unsearchable greatness of God with no hindrances, no limitations of of a physical body, He doesn't need to sleep to take a break from worshiping and searching out the fathomless depths of God, but he's still searching. God's word is clear enough to confound us, and we should let it. We should be confounded at God's word. The kind of confounding that comes from a believing heart. God's word is also clear enough to comfort Um, We won't read the the entirety of this passage, but as you continue reading in Acts 13, you see these same characteristics continually happening. Uh, The amazement, comfort, God's word being communicated, uh, even the commissioning of these men being mentioned again uh, in, in later verses, verse 47. Uh, God speaks again and talks about what he has sent Paul and Barnabas to do. In verse 48 of this chapter, we see that God's word is also clear enough to bring comfort. When the Gentiles heard this, that God was sending his apostles to the Gentiles, to the nations, not just to the Jews only, because they were rejecting the word, You see Romans 9 through 11 happening in real time, the hardening of the Jews for the sake of bringing the word to the Gentiles. Well, when the Gentiles heard that this is what was happening, they began rejoicing and glorifying what? The word of the Lord. And as many as had, that is already, been appointed to eternal life, they believed. So the same things are being produced, the same effects are being witnessed from the clarity of God's word. This was a comfort to the Gentiles to hear God's word. God's word is clear enough to comfort. What Psalm 19.8 says, 
The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. That's what's happening. They are made to rejoice. They are brought hope and comfort and encouragement from what God is is saying through his men. And they glorify not the men, not the messenger, all praise be to Paul and Barnabas. No, they glorify, it doesn't even say God, but they glorify the word of the Lord, God's word in their eyes and in the eyes of all those who believe is worthy of praise. Every single word of God is worthy of praise to the believer. This is happening here in verse 48. Even if you think about doctrines, areas of theology that are often called confusing and obscure, eschatology, for example, right? The study of the end times, the last days. There are so many opinions. Who could really be be certain? Who could really know? Should we really take a position? Should we really teach and divide, you know, ostracize some people who might not agree with a particular eschatological position? Well, if, if Paul's right, if what God said through Paul is right, then eschatology must be understood. Otherwise, it's not a comfort. You can't be comforted by the details of what God describes when he talks about eschatology if you're unclear. Just listen to 1 Thessalonians 4.18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And then the same thing is repeated in chapter 5, verse 11, because he's not done the eschatological tangent. Therefore, comfort or encourage one another and build one another up just as you also are doing. And in both of those sections from 1 Thessalonians 4.13 all the way through chapter 5.11, what he's talking about, I mean, he is unloading on details that have to do with the coming of the Lord. He doesn't say, eh, just be comforted by the fact that Jesus wins. He doesn't say that. He gives them many details to meditate on and then says, now you take these same words that I just gave you and comfort one another. That means eschatology is clear enough to be comforted by. Answer 14 to the question, how clear is God's word really? It is clear enough to convert. We see that in Acts 14 and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. If it was unclear, you would not be a Christian. If God couldn't articulate in a way intelligible to you, you wouldn't know what to believe. The fact that there are any Christians anywhere means God was clear. You're the evidence of the clarity of Scripture. Your salvation is proof that God was clear when he spoke because you believe the gospel. You tell the gospel to other people. Of course God's word is clear. It's clear enough to convert. You weren't converted by clever arguments or rational discourse or somebody's philosophical uh, logic. That didn't convert you. What converted you was a proclamation of the word an articulation of truth, either directly from God's mouth in the word or from someone else faithfully articulating it, and you believe. So God's word is clear enough to convert. You can write down James 1.18. It was through the word that we're born again. 1 Peter 1 says the same thing. Regeneration, God loves to use his clear word to regenerate his people. So to even think about the, the, the experience, if you will, of new life, of the new birth, God giving someone a new heart, inclined now to believe him, love him, fear him, obey him, that new heart 
God refuses to give apart from the person to whom he's giving the new nature, hearing his word. God's word is clear enough to be used by the Holy Spirit to produce a new heart in an individual. Answer 15. We've got 18 total. Answer 15. How clear is God's word really? Clearer than personal experience. God's word is clearer than personal experience. Let me show you this from Luke chapter 16. Jesus tells the hearers in the vicinity of his voice about a rich man and a poor man named Lazarus. Rich man is wicked. Lazarus is faithful, believes God. So when they die, the rich man goes to hell. Lazarus is in the presence of Abraham. This is a great place to see the clarity of God's word when you see the conversation that happens between this rich man who's in agony and Abraham. So let's pick up in verse 23. In Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus had, and Lazarus, bad things. But now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, the rich man, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, here it is again, contradicting what the man is thinking. He says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded, even if someone rises from the dead. Interesting. Resurrection, there's not a greater miracle you know, horizontally speaking, that you could witness than someone literally rising from the dead. The point that's being made here, though, as Luke records this teaching of Christ, so what Christ is teaching is that those who are not already convinced by what the scriptures clearly teach would not be convinced by someone who rose from the dead. What this man is wanting is someone, Lazarus, namely, to rise from the dead and, and come to his family with a clear articulation of what they must do to avoid the torments of hell. Abraham says, no, they already have a clear witness. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the Old Testament even for a New Testament audience, Luke by ver or Jesus, by virtue of this teaching, Luke by virtue of the recording, and then Abraham by virtue of the details of the story itself, all agree, no, the Old Testament's clear. Abraham believed that, apparently. Jesus believed that, Luke believed that, the Old Testament is clear enough to convert. 
without the witness of someone rising from the dead. John Chrysostom, a fourth century church father, commented on this passage and said this about people not being convinced by a resurrection who weren't already convinced from the clarity of the scriptures. He says, the Jews prove that this is true, that he who does not hear the scriptures will not hear even those who rise from the dead. For when they had not heard Moses and the prophets, neither did they believe when they saw some of the dead rising. Right? This actually happened in real time. John 11 with Lazarus, a man named Lazarus, People who didn't believe saw Lazarus resurrected by Jesus and then went and told the Pharisees, and then Lazarus had a bullseye on his chest. Kill him because he's the evidence that we don't already believe the scriptures and we're wrong. So Chrysostom goes on to say, in order to learn another reason why the teaching of the prophets is more worthy of belief than the report of those who rise from the dead, Consider the fact that every dead person is a servant, but what the servants utter, the master has uttered. So even if a dead person rises, even if an angel descends from heaven, the scriptures are more worthy of belief than any of them. For the master of the angels, the Lord of the dead and the living, himself has given the scriptures their authority, Therefore, let us not seek to hear from dead people what the scriptures teach us more clearly every day. Scripture is clearer even than the testimony of resurrected witnesses. Answer 16 How clear is scripture really? As clear as any passage foolishly used to prove otherwise. Scripture is as clear as any passage that someone might turn to to say, see, that's not clear. Or see, scripture says it's not clear. Just think about, and I've been in these conversations, someone who would seek to use the Bible to say, Scripture is not all that clear, or there are portions of Scripture that are not clear. What would it take to prove that Scripture is not clear? Let's consider what it would take to prove Scripture wasn't clear. Well, Proverbs 3, 5, and 7 say that we can't answer that question for ourselves. Trust in the Lord, trust in Yahweh with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding, Proverbs 3, 5 says. So your own, you can't lean on your own understanding to answer this question, how clear is God's word? Verse 7 says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. So if I looked to myself, if I looked within for an answer to that question, how clear is God's word? Is all of God's word clear? Let me see, what do I think about that? Is it clear to me? And then, and then you answer that question from that position, from that starting point? That's being wise in your own eyes. You're looking to self for wisdom. So that option entirely is off the table. You don't have the answer. I don't have the answer. I don't know the answer in myself to how clear is God's word. Who does know? Well, God knows. Trust in him with all your heart. Do not be wise in your own understanding, but instead fear him. So out of it, from a fear of God, I must trust him for the answer to that question. The chapter prior in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 2, has already told me 
from where wisdom and knowledge and understanding come. These things come from Yahweh, specifically from Yahweh's mouth, according to Proverbs 2.6. What he has said, God has told me what to think about the clarity of his word. Okay, that's helpful in one sense, extremely helpful, because now my answers are limited. The source for my answers are limited. It's confined within this book. Great, I just need to read all of it. And I can have an answer to how clear is God's word. So to prove that God's word is not clear, The only legitimate option you have is scripture. You would have to find a passage of scripture to tell you God's word isn't clear. And from there, the only thing left to to really discover is, is that passage clear about how clear God's word is? And the answer would have to be yes. Anyone who would say, see, this passage says God's word isn't clear. Do you clearly understand that passage? Well, yeah. Then it's clear. It actually proves the very point that you're trying to dispute. Even with something like parables, and we'll talk about this in a couple weeks when we talk about the, you know, claimed, alleged obscurity of God's word. Even something like parables, You know, people have appealed to parables. See, Jesus is trying to not let them understand, so he teaches in a way that's obscure. If you have to appeal to parables that are the, the instance that God is trying to veil his meaning to those who don't believe, if that's your proof that God's word isn't clear, then even it proves the point. People who don't believe and refuse to believe what God has already clearly said, then he starts to communicate in, the, in a way that's actually more challenging to the human hearer. But those who believe get the meaning unveiled for them. That's important. Yeah, God's word is clear. It's clear enough to be understood by those who believe. And when he communicates in certain ways, it's clear enough to veil his meaning to those who refuse to believe it anyway. No passage could be appealed to as proof that God can't speak clearly. Answer 17, how clear is God's word really? Well, it's as clear as scripture says it is. And this is just making the same point. Just think about the past few weeks as we've talked about the clarity of God's word, the perspicuity of God's word. How are we proving that scripture is clear? Not to human logic, not to outside biblical resources, not to extra biblical data, not to teachers who are esteemed. How clear is God's word really? We just open the Bible and let it tell us how clear it is by experience, even if you've never sat down to uh, understand, consider, meditate on the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture, maybe for some of you that's new, that language to do a deep dive into this doctrine, but you've seen it every single Sunday and you've experienced it every single Sunday. God's Word is opened. And voila, you you get clarity because faithful men are opening God's word for you. The, The proof that God's word is clear is experienced by believers. Proverbs, you can write down Proverbs 8, 8 and 9. All the words of my mouth, God's wisdom says, are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. That is inherently when God opens his mouth and from his mouth come wisdom, all of it is right. Nothing is twisted or crooked in them objectively. And then subjectively for those who hear those words, verse 9, they are straight or that is they appear straight to him who understands. 
and right to those who find knowledge. People who want to believe God's word, people who are inclined to do God's will, the word seems clear to them. Uh, one, one reformer said, if we do not see clearly, it is because we are sick. Something is wrong with us if we don't see clearly. Last answer, answer 18. How clear is God's word really? It is clear enough to make martyrs in the New Testament, that is, specifically. Again, God's word is clear enough to make martyrs. Jesus himself would fit into this category. Jesus was crystal clear on what God had said. Even from the scriptures, you can write down Hebrews 10, 5 to 7. He understood the Psalms so well that he knew exactly what God had commissioned him to do. And he said, that's what I'm here for. That passage, huh, I need to fulfill that. John recorded, uh, in order to fulfill scripture, Jesus said, I thirst. Jesus so clearly understood what God had already written through Moses and the prophets that he could make purposeful decisions to have it be fulfilled. Jesus was a, a martyr, if you will. If you put so, you know, if, if we can fit Jesus into a martyrdom category with New Testament saints, it was the clarity of God's will that drove Jesus to the cross. Stephen, the apostles, Barnabas, uh, who experienced persecution, almost all of them unto death, Silas, Jason, and the church at Thessalonica, Gaius and Aristarchus, recorded in Acts, the church at Rome apparently were persecuted. Paul makes reference to that in chapter 12, how to deal with their persecutors. The church at Philippi, it was granted to them to suffer. The audience of Hebrews, the audience of first and second Peter, revelations, tribulation, martyrs, all of them martyred because of the clarity of God's word. They so clearly understood what God had said, they were willing to die for it. I have a list that I'm not going to get to of martyrs recorded by John Fox. Uh, he records New Testament martyrs. Let me just give you a couple. Matthew. He wrote his gospel in Hebrew, which was afterwards translated into Greek by James the Less. The scene of his labors was Parthia and Ethiopia, in which, later, in which latter country, that is Ethiopia, he suffered martyrdom, being slain with a halberd in the city of Nadaba, AD 60. Matthias, of whom less is known than of most of the other disciples, was a elected to fill the vacant place of Judas. He was stoned at Jerusalem and then beheaded. Andrew, the brother of Peter, he preached the gospel to many Asiatic nations, but on his arrival at Edessa, he was taken and crucified on a cross, the two ends of which were fixed transversely in the ground, uh, hence the derivation of the term St. Andrew's cross. Mark was born of Jewish parents to the tribe of Levi. He is, supposed, he is supposed to have been converted to Christianity by Peter, whom he served as an, uh, a scribe and under whose inspection he wrote his gospel in the Greek language. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria at the great solemnity of Serapis, their idol, ending his life under their merciless hands. And then on and on and on, he records Peter, Paul, Jude, Bartholomew, Thomas, Luke, Simon, John, and Barnabas. And he ends that section saying, and yet notwithstanding all these continual persecutions and horrible punishments, the church daily increased, deeply rooted in the doctrine of the apostles and of men apostolical and watered plenteously with the blood of the saints. The clarity of God's word does make martyrs.
And Lord willing, we will be faithful if we were called to such things. God, thank you so much for your, your clear word. Help us not only to know it's clear, but to behold its clarity in what it says. Help us to believe and cling to what it clearly teaches. Uh, make us strong in the faith in these things. Make us increase in godliness through faith. And we pray this would all be done to your glorious name and the glory of your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.